So we are in session 19 today and we'll jump into the C Sharp 2.0 features. So what are the new enhancements given in 2.0 which includes the partial types, alias, static classes, property access modifiers, generics. Once again we'll look into the generics again and nullable types and uh, many other topics. So let's kick off uh, um, session 19 and get into the C Sharp 2.0 features. So the first topic here uh, we have uh, is the partial types. Uh, this, is, this is the cons, um, the new language feature that added up in uh, 2.0. So the background to um, this feature, like what it is before, uh, before 2.0, which is 1.0 and 1.1. In a scenario, typical scenario, we, we have seen a couple of examples wherein we place the class uh, inside a given file. So normally we have followed. Technically, you can have uh, a classes, multiple classes declared within a within a single file, and we have seen uh, in most of our examples so far. And uh, as a best practice, people do recommend to have a one class per file, which is, uh, for example, if we have a person uh, class, then person class will go into the person dot cs file, um, so that the code readability. Uh, is always uh, going to improve and also when you do the class diagrams it's going to be more meaningful uh, but that usually causes a problem um, in sense when when the project is a, a very big uh, a large scale project um, and uh, usually mo um, more than one developer might work on a given file so given that situation so if you have a one business class say for example uh, automobile in the in the previous session we discussed and it is uh, having a couple of other um, uh, methods or routines uh, which might be uh, developed by different uh, developers and it's not possible for one person or uh, two multiple persons uh, work on the same file at a time obviously not so that's one of the bottleneck wherein uh, the uh, situation arise and also you cannot actually have uh, because of the reason that um, um, uh, multiple developers can't work on a one class file uh, we cannot split that um, uh, we can we cannot split that class into two different classes and put it in two different files and let the other developers work so that's not feasible because if you start doing that like person class itself if you break it into person one and person two it really makes no uh, sense uh, as within, within the context of the domain object model and also usage wise it doesn't make any big sense so the that, that's what the problem uh, root problem and that root problem is uh, uh, has a solution in uh, 2.0 and, and in addition to that uh, when you go to the code generators if you have uh, design tools which uh, aid in uh, doing the uh, domain object model designing. When I say domain object model, it, it's pretty much reflects to the class um, class model, uh, as we have seen in the object oriented programming concepts. So we have seen car as a class which inherits from the automobile uh, uh, abstract class, and uh, and we have a flying car as another class which inherits from the car class. So that's kind of hierarchical representation or relationship between these classes that whole thing constitutes to become a domain object model which really in other words reflects the real-time objects uh, that uh, represents the business so um, so when you use a design tools like the enterprise architect or the rational tools uh, the couple of other tools are very good interesting tools which aid in UML designing uh, for a domain object model and they also uh, uh, leverage the to create a code out of it directly. We have seen that one of the example in the class diagrams in Visual Studio ID itself uh, with the architectural edition. Uh, there is an ability to create classes uh, graphically and then generate the code out of it. So uh, the code generators again uh, when they create a code out of the model uh, they do uh, generate the skeleton out of it. So they might not have the uh, body within the methods, but they will give you the skeleton like a placeholder wherein the developers can just put the code and fill the, uh, the, the implementation aspects. 
so that gradually reduces a lot of development effort. Uh, so when when the situation uh, uh, comes, uh, uh, it's not recommended again. It's not um, um, going to be feasible enough for someone to generate the code once and then go and uh, write uh, filling the start, uh, start filling the code uh, from there on. So once you do that, what happens is tomorrow if you want to do some changes to the model and again re update your uh, source code with the model, what it's going to do is going to replace all the existing uh, uh, classes uh, with the model. So what happens is whatever the code you have written will be replaced or erased by the uh, the code generators in those situations as well. So the 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 common um, practice adopted is to not to touch the code of files that are generated by the code generator. Instead, you can to create another classes, class files, uh, which will extend the uh, implementation of those uh, signatures that are given by the, uh, the class um, code generators. So in that case, also, uh, it's a, a bottleneck or hurdle to uh, go with the situation. So how, how does this uh, situation is solved in 2.0? So that's using the partial classes. <coughs> okay, the partial types overview, if you see the cshop.net provides a, a, um, a way to um, create a class using a partial modifier. So using the partial modifier, what happens is the um, uh, you can uh, uh, you you can redefine the same class in in a, in a number of files, uh, irrespective of whatever it is. And the forward forward references to all these classes is uh, feasible. For example, you can split the uh, person class into multiple files. Uh, subject that the person is uh, marked as a partial class. So that means uh, that indicates that within a given file. The class is not complete, so the uh, the, the definition of that uh, class can span across multiple files. So what happens at the design time uh, or even the runtime uh, is the the whole um, of, so wherever the person definition is given, so that will be uh, uh, assembled together as a single uh, person at, at runtime. So we'll see a pretty good example uh, in the, the in the demo part. Uh, when we when we see this, so forward forward difference is one of the um, um, uh, one of the feature that C sharp already supports, uh, wherein the, the 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 references of the various classes split across multiple files can be um, referred to each other. For example, you have a property X in file one for person class and property Y uh, for the same person in a, in a, in, a, in a different file. Uh, all ha what happens is uh, when it's uh, referred, the, the person class itself, when it's referred in any other program, it will have both the properties called X and Y. So th that's what the forward reference uh, means. And uh, if the type has a modifier like abstract, public, static, uh, that's one constraint that you need to keep in mind that uh, if, if one of the file uh, defines the class as an abstract class, you cannot actually make it a concrete or a static um, or even public or a different uh, access modifier for that given class. So whatever the class uh, access modifier is defined, that should be consistent across all the files. Okay, so we'll see a pretty good example here. So in this case, the uh, partial class person uh, has a property ID. Uh, and name. This is the same example that we have been using in most of the sessions to be consistent and for uh, to understand it much better. And the print, uh, it has only one method called print and uh, which prints the ID and name. Okay, straightforward. And the second file uses the same partial class. If you see the person name, person is same, uh, only subject that it's um, marked as a partial. Uh, and uh, it has a constructor defined in the second file. Okay, so if, for example, a developer one is going to work on only the properties uh, and their getters and setters, then he can work on this file. And in file two, if someone is going to work on the constructor implementation, they can work on this. So it can be uh, the file itself can be uh, given to two different developers so based on uh, the kind kind of functionality someone is adding. Uh, there's no problem in adding another file three and assign it to the developer three. So all three developers can work on the same class 
on a different files at a given time. So that's why the the scale, um, the development efficiency is going to increase, and there are no bottlenecks um, in that case. Okay. So and in the the, the third one, so the, the this is a class wherein we are uh, referring this person class and making use of it, um, and it's pretty uh, clear enough. It, um, so you we create the P1 as instance and uh, if you go a little top on the right yeah so on the yeah so if you see this uh, the constructor is uh, defined on this file whereas the print method is uh, defined here on two different files but as a usage part of when it comes uh, it's all forward referred so that P1 uh, is referred just as a person and it, it doesn't matter or you it really doesn't make any difference that this person implementation is split across two different files because the, the class itself is partial. Okay, so the important thing that we need to keep in mind that uh, the partial keyword here and the partial keyword here. Oops, sorry. Okay, so I hope you got it. So that's, that's the partial type and um, which is pretty um, straightforward and the output is pretty common so it's it doesn't make any big difference uh, uh, splitting the file across uh, multiple files so we'll see that it, at one time so how it does this really work okay we're going to see practically uh, it's going to work or not and so this is under partial, uh, partial types of the folder within the core examples we have uh, split the person class implementation into file one and file two okay and in this case we have a, the constructor declared here and the file one has the properties and the print method okay and uh, in program file uh, with the static void main method implementation this is the entry point as usual so if you notice uh, these two files doesn't have any static void main that means they don't they are just library files uh, they don't have any entry points okay so you don't really have to comment them but you need to keep this is the only file that I have right now at this stage uh, which is the entry point for the program so um, so once we run this uh, <coughs> can have a breakpoint there and yeah let me run this out and uh, we'll see the output okay so so the output is clear so it doesn't make any big difference uh, uh, splitting the uh, person implementation across multiple files it works as just like a normal class okay so the <clears throat> the code difference if you see the uh, if I say go to definition um, then where it will go so if you see this going to the uh, file 2 okay so it's went to the file too because I clicked uh, the go to definition of the person constructor. So it picked the right file where it is and it showed up. If I go back to my previous file and say click or uh, right click on the print and say go to definition. So it actually took me to file one. You see? Because the go to definition for print is in file two. So everything works as uh, not normal, so except that you can split the class definition across multiple files. So it's pretty interesting feature and it's a widely used feature when you see the, uh, especially in the ASP.NET applications and again once again uh, this is again a very important uh, a topic to uh, keep in mind uh, because uh, this is again one of the, could be one of the common questions people do ask especially when they talk about the ASP.NET uh, because the .NET by default when you create a page the page code behind class by default is partial so uh, especially in the web based development it's quite common that multiple developers can work on multiple uh, files uh, okay so that uh, brings our uh, partial um, topic to a end and we'll move on to the next topic Okay. Yep. So the next topic is again a very important one, which is called an alias. Alias um, is kind of another name. For example, uh, it, you you might have come across the alias as a standard English word. Uh, like for example, you have uh, two different names. Okay. For example, you have a, you are Sam and also uh, uh, and also a Jack. 
uh, at a given time. So people might refer you to as Sam, Elias, Jack, right? So both mean same. So both are referring to one another. In other words, uh, Elias is a, again a very very useful and interesting feature, and this is going to be one of the lengthy topic for today. Uh, when when is it going to be useful? Um, for example, so in this um, of the back background scenario, if you take in previous uh, versions of C sharp, it was impossible to use two different types uh, which had the same name within the same assembly, including the namespace. That's a key thing there. So if you hope you know what's the namespace by now, we did talk about it several times. For recap, uh, namespace is a uh, placeholder. It's a logical grouping of uh, related classes. In other words, system dot io is a namespace. System dot text is a namespace under which it have you you have a number of other classes which are logically grouped to specifically um, relate to the namespace name. So you can have your own namespaces within your class. Every program that we are writing have a namespace uh, uh, within it, and all the classes reside under it. So whoever want to make use of that class, so they have to refer the given namespace. Of course, before that, they need to refer the assembly and then uh, refer the namespace using the using statement. Using statement is the one that uh, starts in the beginning of your code file. So if you are uh, familiar with that concept. So when, uh, when you have a same namespace, a same class defined by two different uh, developers, uh, there will be a conflict. So you you can use either one of them. You can you cannot use both of them because when you when you give the same name, so compiler how will it know which which in, which version you are referring to? So it's not possible for someone to refer to uh, the given version. So you have to tell the compiler uh, how. So it's that's the although uh, this is a kind of a scenario that is that needs to be avoided. Uh, but some cases uh, you might end up having the situation when you're consuming a third-party DLLs and uh, that kind of third-party DLLs might have a namespace already used um, uh, within your project. So we'll see an example. Probably you'll understand much better when we see the example. So it's when you talk about the alias basics, so, so this is the first uh, step. So if you see the um, uh, code snippet here, so this is the first namespace called uh, sample first, okay? And the other one is a sample second. So the namespace is different, right, with respect to two, uh, first here and second here, okay? But if you see, the car class is same in both these namespaces. Consider the, this uh, happens within the same assembly, okay? This happens within the same assembly. Now I want to, I want to create instance of a class and you have did this code, okay? What did you do? Of course, to make use of both the, um, both the car instances, what I need to do is I need to be referring the namespace first. Uh, here, I am uh, referring the, the the namespace simple, sorry, sorry sample.first, and the other one is the sample.second. So both the namespaces I have to refer to make use of the class, right? And now I am uh, using the class here. Okay, now when I say car B is equal to new cars, so now the compiler will be in a confusion. That's called ambiguity. Uh, this confusion is termed as an ambiguity. So it says, okay, there are two cars I see. So I see two cars because you are referring to these two namespaces, and I see there are two cars. One is here, another one is here. So which one do you want me to use? So that's the kind of an ambiguity state uh, your compiler will go in and will throw a compile time error. So um, which says car is an ambiguous reference between um, these two uh, sample first dot car and sample second dot car. So that's what the ambiguity is. So it's not possible for you to use both these car classes uh, in one program. So to, if you really want to do that, so there is a way to do it. So which is the basics of an alias. So this is not possible, which we, we uh, will see. And the, the possible way is using the alias. In which case, what you're going to do is uh, you create an alias for the namespace using a A. 
So in this case, A is an alias uh, for sample dot first. And similarly, B is an alias for sample dot second. So how you use it? Using B is equal to sample dot um, second. So it all, uh, whenever you make use of A, it always uh, refer to sample dot first. And whenever you say B, so it always goes to this namespace. And using that, you can actually make use of the respective car and create the instance of the respective car. And you can make use of both the cars within the same class. So this is how it is doable. Okay. So this is a valid statement. Okay. So now we'll see this uh, in the real time with the code sample. So this is uh, just the basics of uh, the alias. Okay. We, we have larger problems uh, when we see in the uh, next example. So uh, considering that both these are in the same assembly, so we have the uh, sample first namespace and the sample two namespace and the class is same. We don't have the implementation for car, it's a blank, uh, uh, so we really don't care at this point. It's just an empty dummy class, okay? So consider that you have some different implementations in the real time. Okay, so uh, in the program itself, we have the using a is equal to uh, sample dot first and using b is equal to sample dot second and we are referring to a dot car and b dot car. So if I say the good definition of when I say a dot car, it always pointing me to the sample first, right? Because a is referring to sample first. This is a as an alias. Of course, it doesn't need to be a or b. It can be a more meaningful name. You can give any uh, name there. Uh, just for the, uh, and when I say b.car, it maps to the b.car. So there's no confusion here. So if the compiler knows uh, based on the alias name, which one it needs to make use of it. Okay. And uh, yeah, if I had a big breakpoint here, um, and on this code, although it doesn't emit any output there, um, so it's going to run definitely. It doesn't go, give, to give you a runtime error or a design uh, or, or a compile time error. Okay, so this is a valid statement. So we'll take care of this um, and we'll move on to the next example. So what are the complications you might come into? So, um, so what happens if the car class exists in two separate assemblies with the same namespace again? So in this case, uh, we have seen that the namespace is at least different. Okay, so we are a little lucky that the namespace we have sample dot first and sample dot second. What happens if the namespace is also same? If if the namespace is also same, it is not possible uh, compiled uh, comp uh, uh, with respect to the code itself. It is not possible to keep them in the same class. We'll see that. So well, the example what are, what we are referring to is what if both have sample. Right? There is no sample first and there is no sample second. Okay? So both have same namespace and same class. So is that possible? Let's compile and see. No, it's not possible. It says the namespace um, um, already contains a, a definition for class. So it's not possible to have this scenario within the same assembly. Okay? So we are good. So uh, it's not possible. But what happens if these are in a different assemblies? So you have an assembly, a different assembly, uh, they can have the same namespace and same car and also they can have uh, same namespace uh, in a different assemblies altogether. So that means to say uh, two different projects altogether. So usually when will this happen? Uh, this can happen if you uh, really don't have a naming conventions for your namespace, number one. Uh, also, developer A thinks that this is the best namespace fits to whatever he's doing, uh, and other developer B also thinks that uh, this is the best namespace. So both both things the same way because, for example, if you say uh, take a, a typical example like a diagnostics dot log, if you want to log a file, uh, a log of uh, some text to a given file, so both might think okay, logging is the best uh, best fit. Okay, if I want to really keep it in a given uh, namespace, then I can name it as a diagnostics. Both think the same way and both apply the same thing. Okay, so but although both might be doing two different things. Uh, so that will lead to a problem. 
So the number one is the uh, lack of naming conventions and number two uh, will be uh, a, a typical same scenario uh, go can span across uh, a different vendor. So if you're consuming a different vendor uh, assemblies into your application, the vendor also might have the same namespace created. And you can you are in your existing project. You already have that namespace used, and same classes names were used. A typical example could be a math, for example. A math has an add, subtract. A simple example, right? So in any real world, in, in real world, whenever you talk about math, add, subtract, divide, these are same, right? So like minds will write the name same way, and that can be an issue. Uh, so there are several uh, cases it happened uh, in in real world like applications. So so that's the reason why we have these uh, alias as a concept uh, introduced in the C sharp. So it's not that it's not going to happen any time in the world. Uh, you never think that uh, two two person will think the same way at the same time. It happens. It's practical. So uh, so it can happen um, situation. So how will we handle that situations? So in this case, uh, now uh, same example as assembly A has a sample car, uh, namespace sample and it has a car and assembly B has a same namespace sample and same car class. And uh, now assembly C, so now this is our program which is trying to make use of both the car classes and what are you going to do as part of your alias, right? So A, uh, if I do this way, um, the same way the alias we use A is equal to sample, B is equal to sample. A sample is again same. So it, this is not going to fly, right? It's clear enough. So you, compiler can, cannot distinguish between sample and sample. Both look same and when you refer both it's going to break. So it's not going to be flying. Okay? So now comes the um, the feature uh, added in 2.0. So to address such kind of issues, uh, there's a new uh, alias called the extern alias. See, the extern alias um, is a, a is a feature that will let you uh, refer such assemblies uh, within the same project, uh, where by adding an alias to the assemblies itself. Okay, so you're going to have an alias to the given assembly, and use that alias in your code. How? This way. So in this typical example, I've taken a different example um, called the namespace diagnose and has a class called logging and the logging has a method called log. Okay. So the uh, for the sake of demo, the only difference here is the, the text that is uh, printed out by the log method. Okay. So in this case, it says alias demo A, which is referring to the alias demo A DLL. Okay. And I have a different DLL again. So this is a, both are two different projects all together, and they are uh, they are class library projects. So that's why the output is going to be DLL. Okay, um, and hope you're clear with that. And here the only difference is the B letter. It has the same diagnose namespace logging class and log method. Okay, here the log method doesn't really make any difference. The, uh, what makes uh, important here is the class name and the namespace name um, being same in two different assemblies. Here, the um, uh, here alias demo A and alias demo B. Okay, and now comes our uh, consumption point. So now in this case, what happens typically is again someone like-minded happen within my project also. Some of the developer. Uh, also thought of the same namespace apparently. Okay, so he also thought of uh, having the same method like diagnose, logging, log. Okay, and in this case he is doing something else, which is which is a C sharp. Uh, this is my project, so my project name, and print something. Okay, so print something. So both have the same signature again. Log has the same signature. Okay, so now in my code example, so how will I consume all of these three? flavors within a single program. How can we achieve that? We achieve that using the extern alias modifier. So when you say extern alias modifier, I'm going to give an alias name for an assembly. Okay? And also 
uh, with this alias for example in this case uh, external alias alias demo a alias demo b and then adding the alias to the uh, respective um, class uh, namespace again so within the b we have alias demo a dot diagnos and oh sorry a is for alias a and b is for alias demo b diagnos and then we're making use of a colon colon and this is how we're going to refer to the respective methods or classes sorry so once you have these uh, th we have seen this version right so we wherein if the namespace is different at least we can make use of this and here we are making use of the alias to the assembly itself which is uh, alias demo a and using the class um, namespace sorry this is the namespace diagnose and B is referring to uh, alias demo B. So it's a different assembly altogether and the different namespace. Okay, and within A, we are making use of the logging class. Okay, this is the logging class of A. That means this logging car, this logging class is coming from. Okay, let me try. Okay, yes, yeah, this logging class is coming from this assembly. Okay. Uh, and uh, alias demo A is actually referring to alias demo A class and again so this alias name how do we get this name so how do you how, how do you know that uh, this is referring to this assembly how do you know that we'll see in the next slide okay so uh, uh, that's called an aliasing to the given assembly so when you refer an assembly you need to set this alias into that reference so we will see that in the next step so for that for the time being uh, assume that the alias demo a is referring to this assembly reference and uh, a is an alias that is referring to this namespace oops let me put it straight Okay, so this uh, alias A is actually referring to this namespace. That means uh, the alias demo A, which is assembly, and diagnose is the namespace within it. And similarly, uh, this B is the alias to this diagnose namespace. And of course, the uh, this is a reference to the alias to the SM, uh, alias demo B. Okay, so in that case, so I'm referring using the alias name A and B here. We are using a logging. That means this uh, this LA is actually referring to this class, and similarly LB is actually referring to this class. Okay. So yes, you can understand. So there's a lot of messy thing here, but uh, you understand what the code is trying to do with the best A and Bs. Okay. And then finally comes the global. So this is the alias. Uh, these are the alias for the assembly itself. Uh, whereas when you want to refer the same local version, uh, then you can straight straight away make a use of the lo uh, global uh, alias. This is the global alias which is created by the uh, dot and by default uh, for the local assembly, and also for the assemblies that you refer externally. Externally, so we'll see how that is being created uh, when we look into the project properties. Okay. So the output is pretty similar. It this code perfectly works. It's make use of the uh, alias demo a uh, from. So this is the output from. So this log, and uh, demo b from this log, and finally this one is from this log. So it perfectly works fine. So although all of them share the same um, namespace, same class, you still will be able to uh, refer them in the dotnet program in one single program and then make use of that so that that's the uh, the feature of extern alias so we'll see that in a demo probably we'll understand more uh, in detail okay so this is the, the code that is making use of the external assemblies and before this uh, we need to uh, get introduced to this two other assemblies that we have here okay uh, so these are the two separate assemblies that we are talking about and uh, wherein you have the same namespace called diagnose log only that the assembly is different okay and similarly here the assembly name assembly name is different whereas uh, 
um, Elias demo A and with the, this implementation is same we have the same diagnose method the same logging and but it says uh, Elias demo B right so same namespace same class name two different assemblies and now these two assemblies are referred into this class which is uh, this project so how do you do reference we did talk about the how to do add a reference in this case we have to go right click and add reference and since these two projects are within the same solution so you can actually pick them under projects tab so these are the projects available so what I did is we just add a reference to both these projects and once you add the reference the assemblies are created here okay so these two assemblies are sitting here and with that I can actually make use of them so first as I said you need to refer the assemblies first and then refer to the namespaces that means use it by using the using statements okay so that's what we did and now in this case uh, we are using the using statement to refer to the respective assemblies since uh, um, respective namespace sorry since both have the same namespace we need to uh, differentiate based on the assembly so now that's when comes the external alias uh, and again so this is the due from my end to explain how this external alias name appear here okay how do we ensure that this name is referring to the given assembly will it really help to right click here and say go to definition let's see no it doesn't help okay so there is a, uh, there is something that I need to cover uh, how do we get this uh, uh, assembly alias so that ensures that this is referring to the uh, Elias demo A. Okay, I'll cover that in the next step. And the uh, the second one is the Elias B, which is making use of the this assembly's diagnose namespace. Since both have the same diagnose namespace, we are referring that in A and B as a Elias. Okay, and comes the logic class wherein uh, we associate using the colon colon operator here, uh, double colon, uh, and refer the login class and Intel sense is very good here if you see the uh, a colon colon it the Intel sense really work good so it's actually referring to the login class there and it will list the login class and at this point if I say go to definition will that really work yes it works so it is how it is referring it is referring to uh, the alias demo a right if you see in the Probably, yeah, I hope you can see the, uh, the, the last file name within the caption, uh, within the tooltip. Uh, if you see, it is coming, coming from Elias Demo A. So that's the only way I can show that this is really from that. Um, okay, so that's uh, <clears throat> is referring to. And the logging from B. So will this, because since the IntelliSense is able to locate, uh, give me that location, so we are able to go. If you see the last uh, uh, but one in the um, in the tooltip, you'll see the Elias demo B, right? Okay, so that ensures that is re referring to the right assemblies, right code, okay? And yes, compile time, there is no issue with this, and I'm just uh, calling the Elias log uh, with passing A here and uh, log B here, okay? And the third uh, case, the third case is trying to refer to the local implementation of the same logging class. So you can refer that using the global. If you see the global tooltip, it's actually uh, referring to the all the assemblies that is referred into your references. If you see the list of the references that you have here, that will match with the global namespace, or sorry, global alias. So this is a global alias that is referring to the all the um, uh, all the references that you have in the project. So, so that, that means the global uh, alias is added by default to all the assemblies that you refer. That's number one. Uh, and also to the, the, uh, to the current assembly. So using the global alias, you can actually go and refer to the diagnose. When you say diagnose here, so it is actually referring to the, uh, since we have a different alias name for these two assemblies and a global, uh, global has a different thing, so we're able to refer to the current uh, assembly so diagnose implementation okay so if I say right click and go so if I see uh, the name itself says that this is a shop 2 so if you see even the content of the right 
uh, alias demo B here and uh, alias demo A here. So that indicates that they are referred to the right implementation at the given point. Okay, and if we run this and run this code and see, it's pretty simple output. Um, I pass A here and I pass B here and I pass the local here. Okay, which printed out properly with the respective implementations. Okay, um, so that explains the code, right? That's very good. And so, um, again, the IDE support, uh, again, the Visual Studio IDE support for this kind of implementation was not there in 2003, the Visual Studio version 2003. Um, because uh, when, I, when I say the alias name for the assembly, so uh, it doesn't really work well uh, in the uh, older Visual Studios. If at all you get a chance to work with older versions and, and for some reason you have you entered into the same situation then uh, you have to uh, go and use the command line option called the csc slash r option wherein you need to specify the respective dlls uh, by specifying the names and providing the alias names and then compile the program okay so that's why uh, luckily we are in 2010 2010 so 2010 really supports the visual studio version so in, within that how do we do? So this is a, this slide is going to talk about how do we have the uh, assembly alias name. So if you see the projects on the right hand side, right, we have seen the references. We have added these two references as a project reference and the assemblies are referred here. Okay. In this case, these two projects are a class library type projects. That means the output of these two are DLLs. And since the C sharp uh, uh, 2.0 feature demo is a uh, console application. The output is going to be exe. So that's but exe and dlls both stands both refer to the same thing. They are assemblies. Okay. So in this case, so this is where we're going to add the alias namespace. So in this case, uh, if you right click on this reference and see the properties, there's something called an alias, and that's where we specify the name called alias demo A and in this case alias demo B. Okay, by default this is going to be global. Okay, so that's the name we have given used in the external alias. So probably that confusion is gone from your mind, right? And yes, so we'll see that part um, here as well. So it's all takes to right click and see properties and on the properties if you see this is the name alias demo A is given. So alias demo A is used here. And similarly for assembly B, we have alias demo B. Okay, and by default, uh, all of those will be having global. So that's why uh, when, uh, global will be the namespace, uh, that's a default, uh, sorry, not namespace, uh, global is the alias name, uh, defaultly added to the assemblies that you refer. And you can make use of the global alias to access the members um, uh, usually. Uh, in this case, we are actually making use of the global alias uh, to access the implementation that is given within the current uh, assembly. So the current assembly implementation is right here uh, within the same assembly. And this is the logging.cs file. Okay. Hope this explains and uh, if you really enter into this kind of situation or you can handle it using alias, um, in this case external alias. Okay. So the next one comes with the static classes. In static classes we have actually uh, probably we just covered the static uh, as a modifier. Um, but here the static class is, uh, if, you, if you remember what is a static, a static is a modifier that you can apply on to a uh, given member. It can be a, a field or it can be a property, it can be a method, a function, anything you can apply to even including the constructors. You can have a static constructors too wherein um, these static members uh, will have only one copy in the memory for a number of instances that are created for the given class. So that means uh, the, uh, in other words, uh, the, uh, you will refer the respective members uh, from the class name rather than the instance name um, because the the uh, the members or the static members will have only one copy created and they are associated to the class itself not to the instance member 
Okay, so that's the background of a what's static. And now uh, having a static class. Okay, so what's the background for this having a static class? For example, um, in most of the cases, uh, if you have a helper classes created for your application, the helper helper classes uh, uh, and uh, need not be uh, uh, every time create an instance of it. So most of the cases. Uh, that's handled by having a custom logic like having a private constructors uh, to make sure that people don't create instance of it but you make uh, use of these static members so since you can access the static members within a class um, and in the class if you have all the static members uh, you really don't need to create instance of that class anymore right so you just have to access those members directly with the name of the class in such situations, uh, you, you can actually uh, make use of the static classes, and that's the feature added in 2.0. Uh, so in 2.0, you can uh, declare a class itself as a static, so that the, all the members within the class become static or must be static. Uh, by default, they won't be static, but it won't let you have a instance members or a concrete member, sorry, instance members. Uh, rather, the, all the members will be static. Okay, and uh, yes, the, um, yeah. In other words, if you look at the uh, the base definition, whenever the uh, concrete classes um, uh, instance class members, where is uh, when you create an instance of it, or if you don't have a constructor by default, uh, uh, the .NET is going to add a default constructor without your knowledge, uh, and uh, uh, in the, in the static case in the case of the static it doesn't create any default constructor for you it's going to be static and it's going to plain simple and in that case uh, uh, it will not create any uh, uh, overhead um, by having uh, a unseen or unknown constructor behind the scenes so if you make it a such classes such helper classes static it's going to be a very good um, for the uh, the application performance or memory wise and the static, in this case, uh, this is how we're going to make use of it. It's simple, uh, just uh, associate the static modifier to the class, just like uh, having the static keyword for the members of the class. And in this example, we are making use of the format again. Um, as I said in the previous session, we're going to see multiple flavors of the format. And in this case, we are making um, uh, use of the uh, date time conversion. So in this case, this uh, this is a helper class again, and this helper class, what it's trying to do is it's going to format the given date based on the uh, uh, format that you want to get it out. For for example, for um, European or or Asian regions, uh, this is the date format, which is a DDM YYY format, unlike uh, the American, which is MMDD YYY format. So for European region, if you want to have uh, have a different format you can have a helper class like this and make use of it so it's probably most frequently used uh, method or generic method that you can make use of it and similarly uh, for a different uh, format here in this case uh, mm uh, uh, in this case a three letter month uh, and the four letter four character uh, year so it's a different. So there are n number of ways you can actually you make use of the string dot format uh, in this case. So th these such kind of uh, examples are will become like helpers. So these are the kind of helper methods that can be used throughout your uh, project by different. Uh, 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 layers or different implementations. So such kind of things can be as a separate assembly and uh, and the classes can mark them as a static so that no one need to create instance of the helper um, uh, helper class to access these because they really don't have anything to do with the instance variables okay and uh, this is how we're going to make use of it so as uh, been saying um, the static members uh, can be accessed directly with the class because they are associated to the class itself. Uh, you no need to create an instance like a helper, a H is equal to new helper. Uh, you, you don't need to create a H instance for, of this helper, right? It can, you can directly make use of it. That's the uh, benefit of uh, having a static uh, members in a static class. 
and the output is going to be pretty simple here. Uh, in this case, the first case, the output is uh, uh, date, time, and uh, month and year. So, okay, <clears throat> and we'll see the demo. Hope the date is correct. Um, whatever, whatever I showed in the uh, in the slide, and where are we here? Yeah. <clears throat> So this is a pretty straightforward, a simple example. Uh, shouldn't take much time. Okay, so I just put a couple of more here. So just as a comment, so once you get this code out, you can actually make, uh, experiment on different formats that we have here. In this case, if you see the standard format, uh, it's taking a DT as a date time. Uh, in this case, we are actually doing the same thing. Uh, zero is the placeholder where the value will go in, right? So this is the value will go into the uh, zero placeholder. And if you see, the, everything is in the, <coughs> yeah. So if you see, this zero is the, uh, where the value will get in. And the DD, uh, DD is again small case, and MM is a capital, capitalized, and so on. If it is, uh, um, yeah, so you will see the output based on that. And you, and you have several formats given here. Um, you can actually make use of it and see again for time difference and so on. AM, PM time difference, really want to convert that. You really don't have to really crack your head to really convert that. It's a shortcut way uh, to format. Okay, so this is one of the shortcut way to format it. So that's what I've been saying that in .NET, uh, if you're really breaking your head for uh, a given uh, task to finish, uh, for example, in a simple example, if someone asks you to translate a given date time to AM or PM, then imagine how you might be thinking. Uh, if you are not aware of, uh, there is something called a string dot format, right? So in this case, all it ne needs to take is uh, just a TT and pass the DT. DT is a date time, okay, date time value. And all you need is uh, this single line of statement, which will convert that uh, given uh, date time to AM or PM. It's going to say as simple as that. So if you if you really have to write a logic for that, imagine how you're going to do it. Okay, so, uh, so that's going to be a very complicated logic for you to do. Okay, so these are the tips and tricks that you need to be just aware of. Um, there are always a short ways to do. Uh, if at all your if your if at all your if your code length is increasing drastically, then just take a break and Google and see if there is any better way, a smart way to handle that situation. Okay, there will be a definitely one. Okay, so this is the um, static class, which is a helper class, uh, and this is a, and again, so static class can have only static members. Why? Because this static class cannot be instantiated. So you cannot create, oh, sorry, you cannot create instance of this static class. Okay, we'll see all those uh, uh, negative aspects uh, once we see the happy path. So the happy path here is that we're passing the date time here and we'll see the output here. So it's pretty straightforward. It's uh, just converted the um, to a DDMM YY format, DDMM and YY YY format. And again, uh, in the second case, uh, we have this SEP as a uh, first three digits, um, uh, three calves of the year, September month and the year. Okay, it's pretty straightforward. And uh, in this case, uh, yeah, we'll see the negative shades of it. So what will happen if I try to create an instance of this helper class? Okay, I'll say helper. Oops, my caps lock is on. Helper <coughs> h is equal to new helper, right? So this is how we create instance uh, of a class. So what will happen? So th this way it's breaking. It says, <coughs> that cannot create an instance of a static class. So that indicates that you don't have to create or you cannot create instance of a static class. Whereas if I really remove the static keyword, in this case, it is possible. So that line of statement really doesn't break. And the rest of the statements will still be fine because these members are themselves are static. Okay, so th those are already defined as a static, so they can still be accessed, and you can still run the program. <coughs> it will run good, so there's no issue. So what what is the difference uh, in making this as a static versus this? 
So when you do this, what happens is this becomes an instance uh, class or a concrete class. Or in other words, still it's a concrete class, and uh, and it becomes an instance class. That means you can create an instance of that class. What it indicates that there is a default constructor uh, created for you without your notice. So what happens is the default constructor is kind of trying to uh, do some initialization um, when you do this operation. And so when you make that a static, so it will not let you to create instance of it. So that will uh, clean that, have some kind of a cleaned up code uh, and uh, you don't see some surprises out on the line. Okay, so that will eliminate having a default constructor behind the scene. So, so keeping this such members the static always helps um, to eliminate someone creating instance of it and uh, making use of it uh, unwantedly. Okay, so in other words, right? If you have, uh, if you let it, cre let someone create instance of it. What happens in this case? Uh, what you're trying to do here is someone has created an instance of it and left it for nothing, and they still use the helper. Uh, and make use of it. So what happens to this H? H is garbage. It's there in the in the code, but never been used. And you might see as a uh, as a as a as a warning. And if you ignore the warnings, and what happens is you are actually uh, having a code with a lot of garbage at one time. So to eliminate the such situations, you can simply make it static and make sure that all the members are static. Of course, even if you don't make sure, the compiler will let you make sure. So in this case, if I, yeah, in simple, in other words, if I make this non-static, what will happen? Because the class itself is static, uh, you cannot have a non-static members. In other words, it, when you don't make it static, that becomes an instance member. That means these members can be associated to the instance itself, right? So it says that cannot declare instance members in a static class. Okay, that's clear enough because static class itself will have only one copy in the memory and that, uh, that doesn't have any constructors behind the scene uh, to make it as an instance member, to hold any instance members. Okay, so this must be a static. Okay, so hope you're clear with that. Uh, and yes, once you download the code, you can uh, do some kind of uh, play around with the various uh, formats you see here. It's going to be really fun. Okay, and yes, that will, that's taken care. Oh, so just take this code, comment it off, so that we will be ready for the next one. Okay, so that's done. And the next, again, a very useful one, probably might be not that uh, oftenly used, but um, it's going to be useful, uh, certainly. Uh, this is a property access modifier. So in uh, the older versions of C Sharp, in C Sharp 1.1 or 1.0, uh, it doesn't uh, allow you to create in a different level of access modifiers for a property setter and getter. I uh, hope you understand what I mean to be, say by uh, setter and getter. If you see the property, properties have two blocks. One is a set, set, set and another one is a get. Okay, so uh, in uh, 2.0, uh, it's sub, usually uh, the property itself will have an access modifier um, uh, to have it as a public or private. You can still have private properties, doesn't matter. Uh, and, but the whole property itself will have the access modifier, but uh, in certain cases, if you want to have a properties uh, with a global access so that everyone, whoever have access to the class can uh, get the value, read only, uh, I mean to say read only in other words, but still have the uh, flexibility to set the values. So, um, so only some can set the values, but not all which you can have the implementation within the uh, setter, setter itself, but it's not going to be every time possible because if you want to really restrict uh, the setter part uh, within a given inheritance hierarchy and not by everyone, so you can, may, you can have a, an uh, access modifier to the setter itself instead of having for the whole class. Okay, so that's what possible in uh, the property access modifiers. 
okay and the only precaution that need to be taken care of is that uh, only a limitation in other words uh, that uh, you cannot have access modifier for both getter and setter you can have only for one of them okay so in this typical example if you see uh, this is a property uh, for our again popular class person it has a property called sex uh, since as a person, as a human, um, um, this is an, a, a valid one, and it has a getter which is uh, by default uh, inherit the access modifier that is specified for the getter, which is public, right? So get is public, and now the set is protected. Hope uh, this is the time for refresh the access modifiers. If at all you don't remember what is a protected access modifier protected uh, or a special case of modifiers wherein the members are protected um, within the inheritance hierarchy so that uh, only the members or the classes that inherit from the classes can access them so remaining all cannot so it can be across assembly okay so assembly you have this class person uh, in a given assembly B and assembly C uh, is trying to create another a class called employee inherited from person class and in that case the employee class can still access the protected members so that's where if uh, you have another class across the assembly which is derived from the uh, base class here so uh, it can access the protected members okay it can be within the assembly and outside the assembly it doesn't matter whereas uh, with respect to the friend in this case I don't, I'm not, I don't have any members by friend so friend members can be accessed throughout the assembly um, and they cannot be accessed outside the assembly so that's the key thing so in protected friend is a combination of both okay so you can rationalize okay so in this case this example is uh, demonstrating the typical uh, use of the access modifier for the getter and setter so you have an access modifier for the property as a whole and at the same time for getter you have uh, getter uh, is again public in this case because the property itself is public and you have a protected setter so this is a typical scenario wherein uh, you really might want to do this because uh, you want only the classes um, in the inheritance hierarchy to set the value and not everyone right so in that kind of situation you can make your setter as protected so that means it is lex uh, when you say protected from public so public is a high level anyone anyone can access uh, when you make it as a protected it's a low level access modifier so that it has some restrictions on that so uh, in a typical situation like this, you can have one high level, another one is a low level. For example, if the property itself is a private, there's no point in having a public setter because the property itself is private, so that's a high level. The high, at the high level, uh, it's private and no one can access it from outside, so it doesn't make any sense to make it as a public. So you can have one at the high level, another one at the low level, and also you can have the access modifier to either getter or setter not both okay so that's the thing uh, in this case uh, rest all is same uh, uh, so everything goes uh, the same way only that the x modifier is different in this case uh, the person um, constructor the, within the constructor you can able to access the um, the property using this statement this if you remember this refers to the current instance of the class okay so that's the this uh, state uh, this keyword and you're assigning the uh, value that you received as part of the parameter to this parameterized constructor and you're assigning that value to the current instance and that's what happens here in this case the um, the print statement is actually printing the value out so actually in this case you're setting the value and you're actually re retrieving the value so both are good so we're good um, and here the uh, the way we are reading this value out at the bottom so p1 is the instance that is created for a person class and in this case we are passing the value for the last one which is the six in this case m and my name itself and p1 dot print is actually making the call and it's going to print the uh, values out so that's pretty straightforward right and uh, yes so 
that's a demo. We'll see the demo. Yeah, this is the property access modifier code snippet. Okay. Okay, so there's something problem with the comment here. Looks like, yep. So it's so something, okay, I think this remaining part is also not commented. Yeah, probably I didn't select the whole thing to uncomment at the first place itself, so that's why. Um, so uh, the reason I'm having these codes ready uh, for the demo to save our time. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, I don't want to spend time writing the code in front of you and uh, troubleshoot the code errors that we see. And of course, wherever possible, uh, we're going to do the coding demos uh, uh, um, on the fly. It always benefits to speed up our process of uh, uh, sharing the knowledge when we have a, a code snippet ready. Okay, good. So in this case, uh, as we uh, were talking about the yes yeah, so regions again, we did cover, and this is a special property that we are talking about, and wherein we have a private member. Uh, this is a typical scenario wherein you are implementing the uh, encapsulation principle of the object oriented programming and wherein you have the private data member exposed as uh, as a pro property uh, using the public member so that you have some access restrictions on the private data members uh, so typically hiding your private data members uh, is what the encapsulation uh, principle is all about and in this case uh, we have the getter which is public which inherits the the access modifier of the property itself and in this case the pro protected setter we have okay so this is a less accessor modifier than the public so again protected members can be accessed throughout the inheritance hierarchy so that uh, whoever inherits from the person class they can uh, gain access to the uh, this property setter good and we have the constructor this default uh, this is the base constructor and this is a special constructor with the three uh, parameters in other words, you can call this as a parameterized constructor, which is taking three values, ID, name, and sex, and we are uh, setting the current instance using this keyword uh, with the values that are received here. And in this typical example, we are making use of this constructor. Okay, we're having three parameters. And also the print statement uh, is printing all the three values out. Okay. Uh, use it the same uh, formatter. If you, if you see, I'm not actually using a string dot format, but still, right line itself uh, can take a format in this way. So it's, it's pretty good. And uh, yes, so this is where the main program comes, which is a pretty much creating instance p1 um, of person class and passing these three values. Um, again, once again, my name there and uh, calling the print method. So this is a pretty straightforward uh, code. If I'm going very fast, uh, let me know if you're told you're getting uh, <clears throat> lost in between. Uh, I can slow down, but I, again, this is not that complicated topic. That's why I'm trying to cover it quickly, okay? So that's the access um, modifier. We can have a separate modifiers. Again, yes, we have uh, some theory behind this again. So what will happen if uh, I make the getter also something, right? So if I make uh, my getter with a different uh, modifier, I'll say private and compile. So cannot specify access modif access, uh, accessibility modifiers for both accessors of the property or indexes. That means you cannot set the access modifier for both. You can have either one of them. In this case, I can make this protected and I can take this off so I make my getter as protected and the setter is open okay this is also possible you can do this okay so your getter is more restricted than your setter so that means your setter can be accessed by anyone because your class is a product member itself is public and the getter is protected so that it, only the protected mem um, the classes that inherit from this uh, person class can uh, read the values out, not everyone.
Okay, so that's the overview of the property access modifiers. Good. Okay, so next is a very important topic which we have already covered. For those who have missed that last session is a, um, a question, but this is one of the very important topics that we have covered in the last session in detail. And again, I will take a very fast route to the same topic again because that's the topic that's been introduced in C Sharp 2.0. In a single line statement, so generics uh, ensure that you can have a type safe data structures without uh, committing into actual data types. So that means uh, uh, we have seen some very good examples like a stack having uh, a general a, a general uh, stack in system dot collections and also a stack uh, with this um, with the custom uh, uh, custom generic stack wherein you can specify the data type uh, based on the usage wise um, you can create an instance of a stack to associate to a given data type and also uh, you can uh, create a, a, a stack with based on the constraints also uh, you can uh, you can even have a constraints on top of what data type that you can associate it okay probably the theory uh, 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 most of you could understand it or most of you couldn't understand it unless until I show you some code snippet and in action so we'll see um, that as well right now okay and yes so in yeah these are c++ in uh, in c++ these are pretty much equal to the uh, templates in c++ templates and there's the same concept in c sharp dot net but don't mistake uh, being both are same um, uh, in generics are far more superior than c++ templates in sense that the uh, the generics are completely object oriented and they can be participated in the inheritance hierarchy and you can extend them behavior you can have an, an, a number of constraints on top of it and you can actually fine tune it to an nth level and uh, it's really a rich feature uh, to make your collections type safe at the bottom line and also the the, the most important uh, uh, one of the um, item here is the parametric polymorphism. So we did talk about the polymorphism, what it is in in the object oriented programming principles, and the parametric polymorphism is one of them. Uh, uh, one of the type of polymorphism, which I left the topic uh, for generics, and we did cover that generics in the previous session. Uh, and yes, parametric polymorphism. So we'll. Uh, Again, to recap, what is a polymorphism? Uh, polymorphism is uh, having the same name uh, with a different behavior. Uh, you can do it using the uh, operator overloading or method overloading or method overriding. And in this case, when you say generics, uh, in the case of generics, you can actually make your class itself uh, share the same name of the class, but behave differently based on the type parameter. Okay, so what is the type parameter? Type parameter is completely different from the normal parameters that you pass into any methods. Okay, so generic uh, usually addresses the two basic problems. Number one is the performance issues. So in this case, uh, um, look at the standard uh, collection items. What what are available in system dot collections namespace? Um, in this case, um, if you just look at the array list. So array list has an add. It can take any any type of a data type into it. But uh, if you see, yeah, it's it's good. It's very flexible. Um, in sense, uh, it can handle any data type in the .NET language. It can take a reference type or value type within it. But the signature itself is and takes a object, right? So that's the key thing here when we talk about the performance issues with the uh, the built-in collections handling value types. And similarly, hash table takes the key and value pair, uh, where, wherein the key and value are objects, right? Again, so in this case, most of the cases, the key we normally, the usage wise, will be an integer, uh, and it also it can be a string also. So, in, uh, but uh, string is a reference type, uh, but behaves like a value type, which is again uh, uh, a different uh, context there. Um, and in this case, uh, when you pass a value type as an integer to it. 
you're actually doing a box in there. So the boxing uh, by um, virtue of uh, the nature of the boxing itself is very bad uh, for the performance. And the reason is explained in several locations and I will explain again. And uh, yeah, in this case we are taking string, even the queue. The collection queue also takes object. Stack also takes objects. So these are actually built so generic, not but sheet of generics, but uh, technical implementation where they are so generic so that they can take any data type. That makes the collections not type safe because the object itself is the root uh, class for all the uh, objects in the, uh, for all the classes in the .NET. So it's uh, in other words, it's, it's the, uh, the super base class for all the uh, types in the .NET, so all the reference types especially. Um, so what happening here is that when, whenever you pass a value type, it's going to box it to a reference type, that is object. So uh, again, so when I talk about the value type versus reference types, the two, uh, 2500 is an integer type, uh, which originally it's allocated in stack memory allocation because it is a value type. And when it's added to the list in error list dot add, so that is actually boxed to as an implicit conversion from a value type to a reference type because object itself is a reference type. Okay, so that's an impl implicit conversion. You really didn't, don't have to worry about it, but you really need to worry about it when you're really making excessive usage of that collection. So what happens if we have a thousand uh, such values added up to the error list? So we have a thousand uh, boxings occur. What happens? Uh, this value is actually boxed to a reference type. That means it's gone into the heap location. And whenever you read that value out, it's the reverse unboxing happens. So it's actually getting the value from the heap memory allocation to the uh, stack. So what happens at that time? You actually left behind a uh, thousand items in the heap location as a garbage. So you're actually increasing the garbage collection again. So the if you more number of times use the more number of objects within the collection, that number of performance hurdle um, uh, you will have to face it. Okay, so that's where the performance issue with the uh, predefined existing collections. Okay, so which again not type safe. And this is the second time second thing is it not type safety. So how was how it's not type safe? So if in this example, uh, for example, in this uh, stack collection, uh, we are adding uh, an integer one, and we are actually trying to some logic in the program. It's written standard enough, so it's expecting that you add only strings to it. And someone added number by mistake, and you're actually you're type casting your pop uh, method to string. So what will happen when you have an integer? it's going to break, right? As simple as that. So that's where the type safety comes into play. So type safety, if the added members are not type safe and someone can add anything to the collection and because the collection is relied on some other logic in your code, it's going to break. So you cannot ensure it. So those are the two basic reasons, uh, uh, problems that generics trying to solve. Of course, there are workarounds, of course. You can. You don't have to really make use of generics if you say, say you're a smart programmer and you suggested, okay, I can actually override, I can have my own custom class which inherits uh, error list collection and I will override all the add members like this. So in this case, I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to have my own int stack Okay, and implement my own in stack, which takes only integers as a members. So there is no boxing needed. And no one, no one can pass anything else other than int because the signature itself takes int, right? And I'm good. Yes, you're good. You're, it works perfectly fine. So you don't have any boxing issue, and you don't have any type safety issue because your pop also returns integer here. So no issues with this. And if you make use of this. This will always ensure that it will take only number and also it, this pop will always ensure that this is int because the signature itself is done. So if you start doing this uh, for a wide variety of um, data types, for example, for int stack, you have an int stack as a class and for string, you have a string stack and for boolean, you have a boolean stack. So imagine how many classes you will end up writing.
custom implementation. You might end up having a one stack implementation for one given data type, especially the value types, right? So that's going to be a, another major problem, right? The problem is called as a productivity impact, wherein you have to write the same logic. The logic is stack, push and pop. Those are the two basic things in a stack has. And you have to implement the same logic and do in different classes for different data types. That's going to be more productive issue because if it, down the line, if someone says your push algorithm is wrong and there is some bug identified, so imagine where all you need to modify. So you have to modify in 10 different class files, right? So that's again a productive issue. So it's not going to be solve the problem. It's going to create a new problem. So that's when the generics comes into play to rescue. So the type safety and how do you achieve it? It's pretty much using your angle brackets. How do you decorate? Just implement, uh, have one server, impl one class implement, in this case, uh, class stack with T as a type parameter. So this is a T is a special thing. If you notice, that's the special thing here. <clears throat> and also, if you try to ignore this, then you will be at a very bad shape because if you see most of the built-in um, assemblies, uh, especially when you jump into uh, the advanced programming, like when you start using the link and other things, uh, you will see more more classes having this angle brackets T. And if you don't understand what is angle brackets T, then you'll be into big trouble because that's where the future uh, versions of the language are going towards because this is one of the very very rich feature and you can not ignore it okay it's the mandatory that you need to know it so whenever you see a class definition with the angle brackets and T letter that means it's a generic class okay so remember whenever you see this okay this is generic and T is a type parameter so T is not a data type it's a type parameter. So it's a special case of a parameter. So of course this compiler supports it, so that's why it is available. So that's when it is introduced in C Sharp 2.0. And yes, so within the class implementation, I can have the generic implementation of my push and pop algorithm based on this T. So if I, whatever T I use, I use the same T here everywhere and uh, where T is a type parameter. So what does the type parameters? So at the, when I create the instance of it, that's when the T going to take a shape. So when I create an instance of stack, I pass say int, okay? And I'm going to initialize it. If you see the angle brackets, now the T is, uh, int is passed in place of T. So that means now this instance variable, which is obj int stack, will become a type safe collection at runtime. So that means this push will take only int type and also pop will give you only int type. If you see the uh, implementation here, it actually pop is going to, going to give you T back and it's going to take T in and it's actually internally maintaining T as an array type. Okay, we have a complete implementation of this and hope in the last session whoever downloaded the code, they already uh, have this code as part of the system dot collections.generics namespace and I'm just recapping again um, for the benefit of both for those who missed the last session and also um, covering this again. Okay, so this is how it's going to be more type safe and since my push and pop algorithm is written only once here in my stack generic, generic stack implementation and in the second case I create an instance of obj uh, string stack uh, with the data type string and I pass only string and get only string out. So this is type safe, there's no boxing involved and it's again type safe. So you solve both the problems and also the third problem also, the productivity problem. So if there is any problem with the push and pop, I can straight away up change it in my generic stack, okay? So this will fix at one location and it will apply to all the places where it's been used, okay? So that's how the generics is useful. And yes, there are a couple of constraints that we have discussed in the previous session. Uh, yes, I probably can, it's a good chance to show it, show a demo. 
Yes, uh, in this pro project, I also just add uh, the same uh, piece of code uh, which I showed in the last session, and I'm showing it again. So this is a pretty much the whole stack implementation I have here. At this point, really, we don't really care about the implementation. All we care about the T uh, um, stack T and the T here, and also okay, this is the constructor with the default. Uh, here is the constructor with the size. You can pass the size, and we are not actually making use of the constructor in this case. We are more interested with the push and pop. So we're in the push algorithm. Okay, you hope you understand the data structures. I don't want to elaborate on what the push doing and what the pop doing, which we have already covered. Um, for the sake of time, we uh, will need to move ahead. Okay, and push and pop. Uh, this is the generic implementation, and wherein I'm creating instance of this passing int as a data type. So this makes an int stack and this makes my st uh, string stack when I make it this. So in this case, um, the, since this obj int stack is int, if I try to pass a string and build it, it's a compile time error. So this collection is no more a very generic, uh, is no more taking any data type because this is taking int data types. So this is generic enough. Okay, so uh, if I run this code, so I simply see one number one, and uh, in a, in the second case, O N E one because this takes only string. Okay. Okay. And uh, another thing that I covered in the other, uh, other day uh, is, does it really make any sense to be T only? Okay. Re really, it doesn't make any sense. I can even make M right. I can make M, and if you see the my Visual Studio is smart enough to identify uh, rename T to M, right? If I just say that, wherever the T occurrence is there within this class is renamed. In this case, I, I saw it is M and wherever I have a pop, wherever I, I have a pop, I'm going to return the M, uh, the pointer, the item in the in my local data store. I'm just tracking, um, uh, uh, tracking the indexer at this point, so because pop is going to take the um, the top item out, right? So it's a first in, uh, first out, uh, last in, first out. Sorry, it's a last in, first first out uh, behavior. So that's the logic implemented there. And uh, yes, and uh, it need not be a single character. It can be a uh, type TYP as well. Like it can be any number. You can give any user def user friendly name. It's fine. So it, it still works the same. So it doesn't need to be T. Although uh, all the .NET uh, uh, predefined uh, classes th uh, that are available, they all come with T as a default standard uh, uh, letter to represent as a type parameter. Okay, so that's the key note to note and we'll see more of that uh, in the uh, in the coming sessions and in the previous uh, session I just want to recap on a couple of additions um, uh, to the generics uh, wherein we talked about the constraints on top of generics uh, wherein you can have uh, three types of uh, constraints the number one is the uh, derivation constraint wherein you can uh, specify uh, what uh, uh, what type of uh, data members uh, you can add to the type parameter. So T in this case, it can be a value type, a reference type, it can be anything again. So uh, you can still restrict uh, to pass only a specific set of uh, uh, parameters uh, to it. In this case, using the derivation, uh, using the where as a reserved keyword, uh, you can specify that only the classes uh, which implement a given interface or inherit from a given class can be passed as a parameter. That's when you can apply the derivation constraint. And the second one is a constructor constraint wherein you can specify with the using the new, which is the uh, the the instance like the constructor itself, you know, you, you create using the new. And it can be parameterized constructor or default constructors. In this typical scenario, uh, ensures that whichever class has a default constructor can be added to the your generic T as a type parameter. And the last one is a reference or value type. You can also restrict uh, the T to be only value type by specifying it as a struct. And also it can be only a reference type by specifying it as a class. 
So we did see the uh, same examples. In this case, this is a derivation constraint, wherein I'm not going to run the code, but just uh, or run through the slide to save time. And yes, in this case, T, where clause is applied to specify T, you take T only when uh, T implements I serializable interface in this case, okay? And the class implementation here, since I intend to pass person as an item to it, so I must implement the I serializable interface. And of course, I serializable has a get object data, data and we did cover in detail what is I serializable interface. Uh, in the previous sessions and uh, yeah so uh, so once I implement this then only I can pass this person as a, you can create a stack of person so that ensures that uh, the stack will take only the class or type that implements I serializable interface that's where you're ensuring here okay and yes, we did see the demo in the last session. I don't want to recap again or redo again. So in the, the second one is a constructor constraint wherein you're specifying that uh, with the new and open brackets and close brackets. Or you can actually pass a couple of parameters to the um, to the constructor. So this ensures that the, the respective constructor, whatever is specified here, either it's a default constructor in this case or a parameter else constructor uh, to ensure that the T uh, will take only the um, only the classes that has the default constructor uh, or the given the con given constructor. In this case, the person is having a default constructor here as a person, wherein it's in just initializing the ID and name as uh, some default values, and that's when the person can be added to the stack. Okay, if it doesn't have a default constructor, uh, uh, then you cannot add a person to the stack. So that's what it ensures. Okay, and yeah, why why will you really want to do that, right? So if you really ask, why do you really want to constraints, right? For example, in this case, right, um, you have a push and pop mechanism implemented, and uh, consider that the push or pop uh, are doing some logic that ensures uh, that make use of the uh, given constructor. So it won't initialize the underlying members with the given parameters. Uh, so they rely on the respective method or they rely on the respective interface or so on. So the logic is dependent on that. So in that case, you need to ensure that the stack takes only those um, classes that implements the given interface or has this method or so on. So then only it can uh, ensure that you will get the, the um, data types or data types that will ma that will adhere to your logic. So to ensure that you need to have these constraints defined. And the last one is the class or structure. So you give, when you say structure, that means the uh, the T will always take value types. Okay, any value types, int, bool, anything. And when you say class, that means it can take only a reference types. It starts from object, it can take string, or string buffer, whatever, anything. And uh, yes, that's how you can restrict. So those are three main constraints you have, okay? And yes, we did talk about even the uh, predefined uh, collections, or, or generic collections in collections, um, in generics.collection namespace where you have dictionary, t key, t value, list of t, q of t, and stack of t, so, so on. So they were um, open to you to explore more on that area. Um, but Okay, so that's about generics and uh, we did talk in um, detail. And I hope um, you like this topic and it's really uh, a very interesting and good topic. Uh, yes, uh, then the next one uh, is the nullable types. Okay, so the nullable types is again a new concept. It's a very, very useful concept. Uh, again, uh, if you compare to the background how it used to be before, of course, it really makes sense to discuss. So when you have an integer, so what is null, by the way? So null is a default uh, value that uh, any reference types will get it by default. That means it, it does have nothing. It's empty. So it's created, the instance is created, but the values are not initialized, in other words. So null is a, a default value for a reference types. 
Okay, so we'll uh, take a quick look of uh, this level types, okay? So this is just a playground area for me to just explore a little bit of code here. Okay, before we go further, uh, in, in this case, int i. So we did uh, saw the list of the default values that are assigned by default uh, when you don't assign it. Okay, so for int, the default value is 0. And for objects, okay, so this is an instance of an object created, and the default value for obj is null. So this is a reference type and this is a value type. That's a clear distinction, right? And of course, this is a warning showing that uh, um, the value, the variable is created but never used. So right now, I'm not going to ignore that um, uh, warning, okay? Um, so so that, that's what happens. So now, can you assign a null to integer? That's the question. Can you assign a null? No, you cannot. So cannot convert null to int because it is non-nullable value type. So if I say all value types are not nullable by default. The reason being because null is a default value that can go with the value types. That is I can put obj is equal to null. Although it is default, I actually can do this. Okay, so this is the default value for uh, zero is a default value for int and for objects null is a default value. So null can be specified to uh, reference types. So why do you really need a null to a value type? So why do you need? So that's a question. So you will uh, experience a, a situation like this, right? So I'll take this code off. When will this happen? When will you need? Okay, if we, in this typical case, okay, as so a person as a uh, um, itself has the properties, right? ID and name, and this person has a data table inside the database. Okay, and you're mapping um, these person um, in the class, which is your domain object model, mapping these attributes, ID and name, to the database uh, table person and ID and name respect to columns, right? So when you load the database items to your collection of a stack of persons here, so what happens here is you're trying to map the database elements to the um, to your class instances, right? So what happens if there is a null in ID in the database? So you, although your ID is here, it's not a nullable. So if you try to assign a null value directly, when you're actually trying to map the ID column of a uh, database table to the uh, ID uh, property of the class, it's going to break, right? You cannot straight away assign the null. So that's when you will actually experience the need to uh, have uh, to for the value types to accept null. Okay, that's a typical scenario. That's a very, very valid scenario, and you will definitely come into that scenario irrespective of what when you're dealing with um, our database versus the application. Okay, so uh, in those kind of scenarios, uh, nullable types are very, very useful. And if you don't have nullable types, what you need to do is you need to check the respect to column value. If this is a, a DB null, okay, then assign this with the default value, which is zero else assign the given value. Okay, so in that case, whenever you say my ID is zero, that means it's null. So that's what you have to write a clumsy logic to check if it is a null or not and then handle based on the value. Okay, so that's a like a kind of a, it works, but it's a clumsy, right? You have to write so much, so much, so much of code. So to, uh, to get rid of that, uh, we have the nullable types in 2.0. So again, uh, uh, surprisingly, I have seen people who are not aware of uh, a nullable type available in uh, 2.0 onwards. I have seen codes written in 3.5 framework, but still they write the same way, where they check for if the field is equal to null, db null, then do this, else do that. No, that's people still do that because they're not aware of uh, there is a nullable data type available. And that's again, I repeat, 
whenever you think your code is increasing drastically for a given logic, think again. So Dotton has a very, very smooth and easy ways to do things. Uh, much with a small code, you can do a big things. So again, so nullables is one of the very useful uh, feature available uh, which you can uh, make use of it. And uh, yes, in this case, how do we do that? Okay, so how do you do that is the question. So we'll see uh, the nullable type overview. So the nullable is again, if you see the T is again visible here. System dot nullable of T. T is a type parameter. So this is a, a structure that is available in uh, .NET 2.0 uh, which makes your uh, value types nullable. So this is a structure. Remember system dot uh, <coughs> nullable is a structure. So this is a, just a definition that I, I just copied from the object browser for the system. And this is a structure and it is a generic structure. Again, so whenever you see this angle brackets and T, <coughs> it is generic. Whereas T is a structure. Again, this has a constraint already. Uh, and to, to make sure that T is always structured. So we did see this constraint, right? So you can actually do the same thing <coughs> if you really want to do it uh, to make sure that your, your type parameter is always structured. So this is the exact real-time use of having uh, the generic. So in this case, <coughs> this nullable can apply to any value types, right? <coughs> Excuse me. So the next uh, uh, here is the question mark, right? So um, yes, this is a question mark is a special thing. So this is an implicit and explicit op uh, operator. In other words, uh, the uh, this is something new that we haven't seen, <coughs> which will uh, make the question operator uh, special for uh, implicit types. So because because of this implicit and explicit uh, operators available for the implemented for the system dot nullable structure, we can create variables uh, with the data type and question mark and i. It is a normal way. If you want to really create a, a normal int, you just have to create int i, which is good. And int question mark i makes it special. So int question mark, this i it becomes a nullable value type. And this again, bool question mark b becomes a nullable b. And float F becomes with question mark there a flow, uh, nullable float. That means you can assign a null directly to these values. Okay, and the next important thing is has value. So whenever it is a uh, the system dot nullable t has a implementation called ha has value. This will ensure not ensure it is going to uh, give you a true or false uh, saying that if the given value has a value or not. So for example, if we say null, that means the has, val has value will give you false. Okay, and also another interesting thing here is the intelligence, right? So I just declared int j, uh, int question mark j is equal to null. So just initial value is null to make sure that j is a nullable type. And if I see the j uh, in the intelligence, it has a has value, okay? And this has value won't be there for a normal integer. Okay, which is without the question mark, and we'll see that again. Okay, so the important thing here is to show the has value is actually making the nullable t. So this ensures whenever you make a question mark, this j becomes a nullable system dot nullable of t. So this is again a generic implementation again. So as I said, generics you cannot ignore. If at all it's not getting into your brain, you must feed your brain. Uh, and certainly, um, I think I have covered it in an easy way. Uh, if at all you think you haven't covered in the best way you could understand, so let me know. Probably I can uh, find other ways to cover that topic. Okay, so nullable t, this is a code demonstration we're going to do. And in this case, uh, we just use the same person with the person question mark where an ID becomes a nullable property now. Okay, so ID becomes a nullable property and my constructor is again specified with a question mark. That means it can accept a null value. Since my ID is also a null value, if I take a null value, I can assign a null value, right? So I can straight away, if it all database field uh, for ID is null, I don't 
really have to write any logic that null will straight away get into my ID. Okay, and in this case, when I do a print statement, I want to print um, the ID. So in this case, I'm making use of um, this current instance ID property. Does it have a has value, which is such if statement that checks whether if this returns true or false. And if it is true, then I'm going to call the ID and show because if I just try to print the ID directly, you will not see anything. So that's why um, if it is uh, ID is not uh, doesn't have any value, then show it as a null here. Okay, this is just to print to make sure uh, to cover the has value as well in this case. And uh, yes, in this const uh, in this main program, I'm passing null directly for the constructor. And of course, in this case, there's no null, and there's a valid name, and uh, we are printing them out. Okay, so we'll uh, come back with the uh, nullable compare again. So we'll just uh, take a quick demo. Okay, and we'll come back to the last two statements. They're a little special. Okay, so this is the same piece of code. Uh, with the print statement and if you see there's a, qu a question mark to the int which makes the ID as nullable and also here the ID is nullable and that's when it's taking the uh, null value here okay so when I hit the run button so it runs good and the last two statements will cover immediately so in the first case we have null and second case we have 200 because um, I passed in null and that's my, that ensures my print statement really works. So in this case if I had a breakpoint here or let me step down and uh, do it. So the has value is false when, when the ID is null, right? So it's good and that's when it is trying to print the second case which is else part. And uh, I will run this again to come to the next point where I have uh, 200 and the has value is true. So that means it has a value. Okay, so the first part succeeded, right? So that uh, ensures that the has value works good and it takes null. And if you look at the negative aspects of it, if I try to change the signature not to take a nullable type, what will happen? I just make it int, okay? Compile, so of course, as expected, there is an error says int does not contain a definition for has value okay my there are three errors of course the first of the uh, most is the has value definition is not there because it's no more ID is no more a nullable type okay so the question makes it special case because has value is there for nullable type how do you do that we can go to the browser yes it's uh, it's already open here so if you see the nullable type as specifically filtered for 2.0 here. So this ensures that this feature is available in uh, framework 2.0. And if you see in the object browser, you, uh, you can actually filter based on the framework that you have installed on your machine and uh, map to the respective um, framework. And of course the base types uh, here um, has the base types of course from, from the uh, value. Uh, okay, so these are the additional things that you can see from the object browser where you have the type, uh, the explicit operators and the hash value is a special case for nullable T. Okay, and there is something else here which is called system.nullable. This is not a generic one. If you see, the system.nullable is again a special thing here. What base class it has, it is again from object and it has a destructor. If you see this, it uh, makes it a destructor and this is the constructor for this uh, nullable type. And uh, it doesn't have uh, all the methods uh, that are available in nullable T, especially the uh, has value, right? So this, what is the use of nullable? So nullable has the main three methods for compare, equals, and get underlying type. So this nullable type is again a static class. If you take a close look at of this, this is a static member. This is a static class. That means you cannot create instance of this class. So then what for you use it? As I said, static classes, you can be use them as a helper classes. That means you can actually make use of the compare and equals to compare two different nullables. In this case, T you have and both it takes two different variables, right? 
it takes a layer of t at the same time it is a, a, a class that means you can make use of the compare nullable to with anything that means because it takes uh, it is a class nullable is a class uh, you can actually pass in any nullable data type it could be a value type or reference type which supports null values to compare them okay in this case um, what we did is exactly that what I did here is I just passed the uh, ID which is a nullable uh, value type uh, to compare the p1.id to p2.id and similarly uh, here with the p1.id to p2.id uh, with the compare here and equals here okay so since the first one is null and the second one is uh, um, here the first one is uh, null and because when I try to print null directly it's empty there's nothing there and the 200 so the null and 200 if the compare is giving minus 1 and if you remember we did talk in detail about compare and we also did cover the I comparable interface where we overridden the compare implementation a custom implementation to sort the uh, custom uh, class within an array we did that exercise in the previous session and just to reca recap on that so it's a compare uh, implementation will give you an integer out it could be a positive negative or zero value which will ensure to sort the values in a collection okay and equals is going to check whether the given two values are equal and it's uh, the data type is boolean whether it's if it is equal it's true otherwise false okay so that takes care of the nullable type. Okay, in this uh, session 19, we did walk through the partial types uh, as a C-sharp uh, 2.0 features and how can we split a given class into multiple files. We did see a very good demo. We did see an alias. Uh, how can we use alias to referring in assemblies or, uh, or classes conflicting with the namespace? And also we will see an external alias uh, with a very good example. Uh, how can we uh, refer assemblies ha having a conflicted uh, namespaces? And also we will see a static class, uh, where, which is a new feature in 2.0. How can we make use of the static classes for uh, helper classes, which we're going to see down the line in a very good in our project implementation in the real world? How can this be useful? And we did see property, property access modifiers. Uh, we can define uh, multiple access modifiers uh, for getters and setters uh, that we have seen uh, in a very good demo. We did walk through the generics again, which is uh, uh, 2.0 uh, uh, introduced in 2.0. Uh, and we did walk through all the uh, problem statements and how can we solve those problems uh, using generics. Okay, and also we did see the nullable types, uh, which is again a 2.0 new feature and how can uh, this best help us, especially in the database-driven, uh, data-driven applications in general. And uh, we did see a demo as well and uh, we'll continue with the null coalizing operator in the next session. And for now, we'll uh, close at this point.